Hello folks, I'm Pamela Young and this is Thrive 2030, brought to you by Growth Curve. And today I have with me Matthew Driver, who is the Executive Vice President for Services um, of the Asia Pacific region of MasterCard, and he is currently in Singapore. Hello, Matthew, how are you today? Hi, Pamela. Good, thank you. Yeah, good Great to see you. you. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'll just take a few minutes to introduce uh, who you are and your background. Um, I know that you're currently living in Singapore, but you hail from New Zealand, which That's is right. where I also started. Um, and you left there in 92 for an overseas journey, which you are still on. Um, and your first port of call, I understand, was Hong Kong. Then you went to London, came to Singapore, off to New York, and now back in Singapore. Is that pretty much the journey? It's pretty much it. Still yeah. On. Very nice. Well, you've covered um, both, you know, Asia, Europe and the Americas. So you've, you know, got most of the world experience there, which is really fantastic. And uh, I know that you've been at MasterCard for about 19 years. So you've had a long journey with the business since it was a small entity of about 4,000. And in that 19 years, it's grown to 21,000, which is um, a good sized business. Can we just start with where were you when you heard the news and how did it impact you? Yeah, interesting. I, I think we. I was here in Singapore. I was really just, I wouldn't say winding up, proved to be winding up, of course, but um, around Chinese New Year, we were starting to hear um, of, of the situation in China predominantly. I think that was the, the first time we started to hear it. I think naturally, when we moved into this, it took a while, right? And so it was sort of People were keeping a watch. We weren't really sure what was happening, uh, but we very, very quickly learned you know, that it was quite a serious thing. And so I guess my last business trip was in about February. And then really post that time, you know, Asia started, if you like, in terms of having that exposure, being closer to China. Um, and, and naturally, we entered our phase lockdown here in Singapore, really from then. Were you in Singapore or Asia during the SARS epidemic of 2003, four, that period? Well, actually, it was, I was quite lucky in the sense that I just moved um, from oh. Hong Kong to London um, okay. over that SARS and Asian flu period. So when I came back in 07, um, you know, the environment was actually funnily enough quite similar to when I had left okay. um, because naturally that, you know, I think that the, the Asian financial crisis and, and SARS actually created it had quite a significant impact. And I think there are a lot of learnings from the Asian economies from that, and particularly Singapore learned a lot. And yeah. I think we've seen by Singapore's response yeah. that they really were able to be much more proactive and positive, if you like, um, in their response to COVID than perhaps we were to SARS back then. Yes. So for the people uh, listening who might not know about the COVID story in Singapore, would you just give us a thumbnail sketch? I understand um, there was quite a... Um, uh, panic period when the uh, construction workers who live in close quarters and you know large groups sure. of people um, that was a, about the middle way through last year wasn't it and that was a yeah that, that, that really happened in about April okay. and what I would say is what happened was that you know Singapore because of that experience in SARS I think in the in the government processes and how organized people are here yeah. in general you know, responded very well with contact tracing and um, I guess social distancing and mask wearing fairly quickly. Yeah. I think that, um, unfortunately, I think we, there was a bit of an overlook or didn't really think through the impact of the um, construction workers who are living in very tight um, dormitories. And yeah. so once we had some infections come into that environment, yeah. um, that accelerated very, very quickly. So in April, we were seeing hundreds of new cases a day. Yeah. But I think the response to that was very positive, right? We really kind of, the government introduced um, very quickly, kind of said, look, we've got to take control of this. They use army logistics. They set up a very separate um, camp to make sure that everybody had the right sort of space. They were well resourced, encouraged the dormitory owners to um, really introduce better facilities and got it under control. They, I think we peaked at about 54,500 cases in the dormitories out of about 400,000, so pretty high. Yeah. But um, at the same time, these are young men, and a lot of them are fit, um, and there were no deaths because of you know, very, very proactive yes. um, you know, actions from the government. And now we're really seeing you know, they're part of the vaccination program, very, very low levels of ongoing infection, which reflects very well on the, on the response, although perhaps initially, you know, that was something that was a concern. Yes. Yes. Um, I think one of the beauties of Singapore, I remember from when I lived there, um, is that 
things just work. Um, it's it's a it's a small nation, um, you know, physically, um, and a, and a small. Um, Number the population is seven million, which is quite small, but physically it's small. Um, but it's an extremely sophisticated society, isn't it? And things yes. just happen there. Um, and uh, on that point, I would just like to um, switch my back up background to join you in Singapore um, and join you at one of the, one of my favourite locations, which is a, an example of just how fabulous things happen in Singapore. Because flying in and out of the airport once upon a time was just flying in and out of a hangar. And now look at this wonderful example of beauty, which was constructed in Singapore. Now, the reason I chose this as a background is to illustrate um, how things get done in Singapore. Now, you just mentioned large numbers of cases, no deaths. And from my experience of living in Singapore, I wonder, is that that's got to be part of the culture there, which is that things get done rapidly, quickly, efficiently and, and professionally. So is the low death rate, um, would you attribute that to, you know, the ability of Singaporean um, leaders to get things happening really quickly? Um, I'm, look, I, I'm sure that's a, a big, a really big factor. I think that Post SARS, I think that that's always been a bit of a concern that we'd have some kind of virus sort of situation. I think it's always been a scenario yeah. that has been considered, and so I think the Singapore government was able to respond very, very quickly. You yeah. also think, look, you know, like you say, we're a small island nation. Yeah. We've got extremely good infrastructure. The healthcare infrastructure here is very good. The communications infrastructure yeah. is very good, and then the government was able to, I guess, like I noted earlier, introduce contact tracing incredibly quickly. But what we also did was hospitalize those early cases immediately. We didn't wait to see whether they deteriorated. We hospitalized those immediately and implemented the contact tracing against you know, the family members or people they'd been in contact with and isolated those people. Yes. And so that fast action I think really made the difference. And then you've got social compliance in the community um, and you know, a very kind of robust, comprehensive program. If you like. Yes. Yes. That's my point about things just happening really exactly. well in Singapore. They happen fast. They seem to be well thought through. They seem to have already had the agenda um, and they get onto, the, get onto things pretty quickly. And I think one of the things about hospitalising cases early is a large part of the reason why the deaths have been low. Absolutely. Yeah, That's super. Right. Um, when your um, uh, company recognised that this was going to be a much longer journey than a few months, um, how did the top team conversations go? What was on your agenda for the things that we need to do to get through this? What were those topics? Yeah, well, I think, interestingly, I think that the first thing was really ensuring that, you know, we gave our, you know, all our employees reassurance, right? Mm -hmm. A reassurance that they could, you know, focus on their families if they needed to, um, pivot to make sure that they had the, the right resources. We're, we're very lucky our business can be largely run, you know, digitally. And so we were able to implement work from home protocols fairly quickly. Naturally, we had... Um, our own infrastructure challenges to, to get into <laughs> because you're not used to everybody on you know, yeah. the, the, the VPN, right? So we had yeah. to do that. But yeah. look, I think the first thing is you know, very clear statement, there weren't going to be any layoffs. So we, yeah. we made that global commitment for, for all of 2020. Then we really said, look, how do we ensure that you, know, you give the flexibility of increased leave? If you need to take some time off, to you know, deal with you know, something with the kids and things like that, or a tender sick parent if you've got somebody somewhere else or any concerns, we did that. And then I think that broadly speaking, just making sure that people knew that we had their back and we were going to be flexible. I think those probably were the three things. Yeah. And then obviously communicating that over time and ensuring that we were really checking in with people to make sure that they felt um, supported because when you, everybody went away, you just don't have that natural central support network of being in the office, of course. Yes. So um, what were your people asking for? What were the calls from them about? Well, I think that they wanted to understand that you know, they, could, they had the right resources. Yeah. Um, I think they wanted to make sure that we had some flexibility. Yeah. Um, you know, some people are working away from home, so we wanted to make sure that they had the ability if they needed to go home or other things that 
you know, we were able to change or I wouldn't say change, adjust our HR policy. So we just wanted to make sure we knew where everybody was. Basic logistical uh, stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that, and they wanted to make sure that, you know, that um, they not only had the resources to do their jobs, but were, were well supported. And I think yeah. that we tried to check in as much as we could. I think all the surveys that we were very proactive in pushing out to get feedback were very um, well received. And I think it was because everybody leaned in and said, look, you are important to us. Um, please make sure you're safe. We'll figure it out. And you know, we had a structure. We'll quickly go to working from home. We'll then make sure that we get you the resources you need. And, you know, try to make what is a, a difficult transition, at least immediately, yeah. um, as easy as possible. Um, how did it go in India? You've got 4,000 people in India. Did they have... Yeah, they I mean, time? and naturally, I think that we, because we've got a very large analytics um, um, team there, we've got a, a big software development team there, in addition to, obviously, the, the teams that we have yeah. in um, the market. And look, I think that we really went through a pretty tough time earlier on this year, just like everybody else. I think that it was a, a challenge with the Delta variant. Yeah. I think what we really tried to do, because it became an infrastructure problem, access to oxygen concentrators and things like that. So we, I mean, we had our a colleague of mine, um, Ari, who is one of the, the co-presidents here. You know, he's on the phone trying to work with um, a provider to get oxygen concentrators <laughs> into the market. He's using his own card as necessary Good you know, while we built our own corporate response, right? We've, yes. we've built a, um, we have an employee fund to help. Yeah. Um, we, in the end, made a donation, I think, of about $10 million into India to support, you know, remote hospital resources. Oh, um, we made um, telemedicine available uh, if people needed to take that concentrator home because they couldn't get access. We did that, right? I talked to a colleague of mine, his family happens to run a private hospital, um, trying to see, can we make you know, capacity available if we needed to. So I think, wow. so I think it was a combination wow. of look, leveraging the networks that we all had, yeah. but also just making sure that people um, had what they needed. But it, it was tough. And, and, yeah. and unfortunately, we did lose some people. It was a complete tragedy. And obviously, yeah. we're making sure that their families are well supported. But it was very tough for a while. And, and they, yeah. we continue to sort of be really focused on making sure that, you know, we are there for, for, our, for our teams. Yeah. Well, it's fantastic that you started out with, you know, we're not going to make anybody redundant. We're just going to support everybody, which is really, um, it gives people a confidence that they can focus in on the issue, doesn't it? Focus That's in right. on the problem, Completely. support one another, be good team, teammates and so forth. Um, can we just turn our mind to the region for a minute yeah, yeah. and just get a bit of a state of the nation um, overview from you because you've been in the region off and on for many, many years. So you have been through the Y2K disaster, the GFC, um, and now the pandemic. Yes, right. Could you just give us a thumbnail sketch of which nations are um, faring reasonably well and have bounced back quite well um, mm -hmm. and which ones are not out of your portfolio? Sure. I mean, look, across the region, it's a little bit of a dynamic story, obviously, yes. because naturally we're seeing the, the um, I guess, some resurgence of infections with respect to Delta, you know, getting into a number of places. But if, if we look broadly, uh, I think that, and against the themes that we talked about, yeah. infrastructure, government playbooks, you know, compliance, availability of vaccination, all these kind of components are, yeah. you know, the residual strength of the economy, you know, how dependent or otherwise are they on tourism, et cetera, right? Yeah. But if we, if we look more broadly, what we've really seen is that um, you know, everybody went through a pretty similar curve, right? It, it, they have they had the lockdown and they've kind of come out of it. Naturally, the economies that were able to control the impact in their economies obviously have done better, yeah. right? So I would say that Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan, even Hong Kong to a certain degree, Singapore, they've done pretty well. Japan earlier on, but, you know, didn't have so many impacts, even um, Korea as well, right? So I think that those countries that worked quite quickly and, and then followed up, if you like, with a vaccination program yes. have done better. So I think Singapore has done better. Now we've seen um, a bit of a resurgence back. 
um, Taiwan has slowed down a little bit because they could they didn't quite have the vaccinations there. Yeah. Australia yeah. is doing better now that they've got their vaccination rates up, but they still need <laughs> to keep going, right? Because yeah. now the shutdown's yeah. slowing down. But you saw the recovery. You see, you've seen um, those markets do well. China has done very very well. They acted fast. Huge infrastructure, very very specific focused actions. Um, and so they really recovered pretty early. I think domestically, at least, um, we saw that September last year, they had more um, airline flights than they had the year yeah. before. Yes. Right? Obviously not traveling internationally, but they moved extremely quickly. And yeah. I think that that reassurance and positively has been reflected domestically in the Chinese economy. And it's still you know, reported to be growing extremely yeah. well. Where we've seen um, in fact, and really is in sort of the more emerging markets for a, a range of reasons that I mentioned earlier. But naturally, I think India worked fairly well earlier on. And then I guess we had a little bit of a challenge naturally with Delta. That was a really big you know, external shock. Yeah. Um, but, um, and nevertheless, I think it's been a test of the infrastructure. That's yeah. going to come back. But India is you know, proving you know, relatively resistant right and i think we'll see the recovery there yeah. um, southeast asia probably a little bit more challenged just you know we've seen big cases in indonesia um malaysia to a certain degree as well has gone through a very tough time yeah. and it's been those recoveries so we're seeing the sort of the more emerging markets particularly where people you know if you're not in the formal economy there's a large informal economy yeah right you have to go out to work yeah you know, and so that in itself exacerbates the issue. Yeah. You're, you're, you're moving around. You're likely to be exposed. That's right. Yes. So I think yeah. that's where we're seeing the lag. We'll see a yeah. bit of a lag in recovery in Southeast Asia. Um, hopefully, you know, we've seen relative cases increase in a lot of the developed countries, but it's relative, right? Yeah. If, we can, if they can hold on to those, we'll continue to see fairly robust recovery because yeah. the savings are there and the government support programs are there. And those economies where the government's been less able to or hasn't had the fiscal headroom, if you like, to be able to support industry that's been more unemployment, uh -huh. a little bit more impact, don't have infrastructure for schooling, yeah. which unfortunately is tends to be in those emerging yes. kind of areas. Yes. Um, that's where we've got a little bit of a drag. So China will lead coming out, supported by... Although um, they have a new... Um uh, I think they've got lockdown in Wuhan again this last week or two. Yes, yeah. um, they have. And I think they've seen these pluses. I mean, mm. the, the Chinese reaction, you've seen them, they're, they're retesting 12 million people. Yes. I mean, the fact that you've got that infrastructure to do that is like amazing. Yes. And I think that um, that's a luxury that virtually no other country has, to be honest. And I yeah. think that hopefully that they'll be able to, you know, get on top of it and there won't be impacts there and it'll continue to, to yeah. drive the world recovery because China's got a very big role yes. to play in that from, a, from an export-led perspective. Yeah. Um, thanks for that. Uh, I'm just thinking about the um, spending patterns and what changes sure. you might have seen uh, at the start of COVID. Did we stop spending because we all thought, gosh, we don't know when we're going to get our next payday? Or did we start shopping online furiously and start buying shoes and lipstick? <laughs> well, it's kind of a combination, right, to be honest. We all spend like crazy on toilet paper, obviously. And there's oh, yes. all those and that. memes that, that went out there, right? So, yeah. look, I think that naturally there was was the shock yeah. because all of a sudden, you know, and when you saw the shutdown, people couldn't, um, you know, spend, you know, outside, if you like, or were much more restricted. So that naturally went. You've seen a pivot to e-commerce. Clearly, that's a big trend. Yeah. Um, your grandmother now needs to buy or has got yeah. used to buying her groceries online, right? Yes, yes. Uh, um, we've seen where you've had to use cash or cash substitution into contactless payment, right? Yeah. Contactless has all of a sudden accelerated, even in markets where it was already popular, simply because I don't want to touch the cash. So yeah. I'll use contactless. Or in develop, you know, developing countries out here, um, e-wallets, right, connected to real-time systems. So we've seen mm -hmm. in India a huge growth in all payment types, but particularly um, in um, the real-time payments infrastructure on the back of all the wallets that are over there because, yes. you know, people have had to go digital. So, and they'd have to use a card for something, they'd have to use a real-time payment for something else, and they'd have to use Google or PCM. Yeah. You know, all these things happen. So 
that was the big you know, pivot, if you like, to digital. And then I guess within that, if you like, because travel shut down, yeah. um, people have sort of had forced savings because yes. you know people love to travel. So I think we've seen savings rates, particularly early on, people pay down a bit of debt, they're a bit unsure. Um, and then we've sort of seen the sort of excess savings, what we call excess savings beyond what would normally happen because you're not spending it. Yeah. Um, a little bit of pay down. Not going to restaurants, it. not going to movies, not yeah, going yeah, to shows. Yeah, exactly. And so and then what happened was you saw people, once they realised it was, this yeah. was going to be on for a longer thing, then yeah. you saw the home improvement sort of <laughs> being start to happen. Yeah. Um, you know, lots of invest, you know, spend on, I guess, for some reason, you know, you, you sort of, anything that's above the above the waist for being on video calls and things <laughs> like that. So that was good spending. Um, infrastructure, yeah, your yeah. home office, um, um, yeah. Netflix, obviously, and then yeah. digital learnings and all that stuff. And then mm. as people are going, well, I'm not going on vacation. I mean, in Singapore, we've seen, um, I do a little bit of boating around, but, you know, everybody, I mean, everybody has been doing alternatives, right? Well, what can yeah. I, if I can't go on my, on, on a trip, I want to find some other alternatives. So all the boat charters have gone ballistic yes. in China. Oh, no, sorry, in Singapore. In Singapore, yeah. um, In the US, we saw boating accessories the same because you can get out on the sea, you're still socially distanced. It's yep. some, you know, semi-vacation feeling. Yep. Um, so funnily enough, that's been a, a big thing or, you know, discretionary kind of, spend even i think in some segments we saw you know premium cars in the us and other places went up I'm not, oh. I can't go anywhere else. and because everybody's then started to do road trips so now with the recovery what we've seen yeah. is people have been <laughs> uncertain about flights because they haven't been available and so yeah. now you now see this recovery into domestic tourism so that's been a yes. big thing yeah. road trips are up naturally again you're going with your own you know yeah. um group so that's okay yeah. Um, you're not bumping into anybody else. And yeah. I think lastly, you know, you're saying, you've also seen the sort of, as the savings have gone up, you know, you've also seen people that go, oh, well, I, I'm in this house all the time. Maybe I want to move into a new house. Yeah. And so you've seen a lot yeah. of, as particularly as these government support programs have come into place, yeah. you're seeing that people have really made an investment and upgraded their homes. Yeah. And you've seen a lot of property inflation. And because you're seeing the, if you like, the, the, the financial stimulus uh, from the governments and the markets, the reduction of interest rates, yeah. um, it, even though, if you like, household leverage has gone up, debt servicing has gone down. Yes. And so people are still you know, on top of their finances. Yeah. And now, as we start to see the travel recovery and these international corridors open up, you know, there's a surely there's a, going to be a demand for travel, yeah. and my American co colleagues call it revenge spend. I'm not quite sure it's revenge spend, but it, what it means is, you know, I yeah. really want to be busting able out, to breaking out, see yeah. my family. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. that's the thing. And so yes. we're and if people can travel, yeah, as we've seen in Europe and the states and everywhere else, they will travel. So uh, that's inevitably going to come. So as you've seen these changes in spending, and um, obviously as a, you know, must account's a big organisation with a sure. long history of watching markets go up and down, um, mm -hmm. you must have been uh, looking for opportunities uh, to see how can you um, grow through this experience and how can you respond to the needs of diff different customer groups. So can you just tell us what some of those opportunities were and what sort of developments you've made to respond to sure. the, the, the opportunities you're seeing? Sure. I mean, it's a good question. I think there, probably there are two things. One is that, um, you know, over the last, I'd say, well, really I, since I've almost been as long as I've been working at MasterCard, but particularly since um, 2010, um, we've been going down a quite a broad business diversification path, okay. right? So you know, people understand that MasterCard is a, a payment network and we're on your, your card and we enable that transaction, obviously, but we're not... A credit card company we're a payment technology company so that means that you know we're the network and so what we've really been looking to do is one is diversify away from just being associated with credit cards so moving into debit and prepaid and, and commercial obviously but more beyond that to diversify into the services businesses for example that that i that i run here in asia pacific and i think that 
that's been a very big part of what we've been doing, plus digital acceleration. And I think both those components, this path to digital enablement um, and the things that are associated with that, such as um, you know, doing virtual payments, um, what we call digital first propositions, like we did with our full card in the US, where it's all a digital flow, you know, very, very customer focused experience. Yeah. Um, or the, the digital security that we've been doing, um, cyber security, et cetera, those types of services. Yeah. We've just continued to lean into those and they have naturally become more important Standard. as everybody went digital. So I think that yeah. you know, we had a very deliberate strategy um, and with COVID really just accelerated everybody into that strategy. Yeah. At the same time, um, naturally credit card payments fell, right? But then you've had this offset in um, debit card payments to a certain yeah. degree, and in particular, as people yeah. are worried about debt. So that helped our business a little bit, but the pivot to services and naturally e-commerce um, has really made a difference. So last year, full year, I think um, services represented about a third of our business globally in yeah. terms of net revenue. And that was that grew at about 18% last year. So oh. that's really what we've done. And then on- That's really significant. In, yeah, absolutely. And it was an important part of you know, naturally having a diversified business. But then we spent a lot more time, particularly with COVID, focusing on a number of things. Like one is just safety and security in our network. Um, mm -hmm. One, really focusing on the customer experience and working with our business partners in the ecosystem to ensure that um, you know, it's safe for consumers and they're protected with our fraud tools and that the experience yeah. is positive. Yeah. And then I guess, you know, more broadly as well, um, working to engage our communities, right? Supporting small business, um, really doubling down on our inclusion, um, you know, financial inclusion agenda, because yeah. in these sorts of circumstances, it can be very, very difficult for those people at the bottom of the pyramid to really, um, you know, stay connected into the economy. So I think that's really been the third part of what has been a sustained push by MasterCard you know, yeah. over a number of years. And we've really leaned into that because mm. those are the folks who were really impacted by this. Yeah, that's a very um, not unexpected, um, you know, response because the digitization is, um, has, has, I think people have described, we did five years work in five months or we made five years progress in five months. Um, yeah, because of, because of COVID forcing our hand and mm -hmm. it removes the barrier of people going, oh, I don't know if that's a good idea and let's do a risk analysis and all of those things just disappeared, didn't they? So things have sped up. Um, for the, for the people who might be listening who work who, who operate across Asia, who are exporting or importing across Asia, um, can you give us some ideas of these sectors, the industries that you think are going to provide opportunity for people in the future? As a result of COVID, um, what sectors do you see, you know, industries are um, really blossoming of, other than the obvious, which is technology? Yeah, I mean, look... But look, I think that what we're realizing is technology is really everywhere. Everyone's a technology business to a certain yeah. degree. But I think, look, naturally we're going to see a move into um, a lot more. I mean, and it's it's hard to sort of call that out. But what you, you realize is that um, anything that's associated with a, a digital enabled business or the move, the move to, to 5G, right? So I think that's the delivery of acceleration of, um, I guess, any service delivery, but I would say things like, you know, that just in the cyberspace, I think is very, very important. Yeah. Um, I think that's going to be a, a very big thing because we're just going to have to have those environments and make sure that that's there. Yeah. Um, I think we're naturally, it's, it's interesting, it's sort of a, a lot of the sustainability kind of areas is important. We kind of work, we've got a, our kind of commitment to the prices planet and, and planting tree, 100 million trees under that initiative is important. But ESG, I think, is a, almost an important other side of that because with, with COVID, the dependence on technology, there's been a lot of focus on the, you know, the sort of the environmental sustainability of these sorts of things and sustainability sure. in general. So I think we're going to see you know, a, a big growth in that area about how do you make even um, what might be a traditional business, you know, even, you know, more sustainable, right? Because I think that, you know, everybody has said that, you know, there's a commitment to, you know, transportation and electronic cars and infrastructure. So you're going to see 
that happen. Uh, mm -hmm. The movement to, I see like the internet of things and the connectivity and all that infrastructure. So we're going to see yes. real growth in, you know, kind of data and analytics. We're also, um, my daughter works um, in, or was learning to work in animation. I think all those kind of creative mm. skills are going to become more and more important as, mm. you know, you're delivering services digitally, but how do you make sure that they're um, mm. just simply made available to people? I think you're going to see advances in remote access, things that would transfer or transform things like healthcare. Mm. You're really going to be in a situation where, you know, all of a sudden you're going to be able to make um, healthcare services available. Mm -hmm. I think you know, there are a whole lot of cool startups in, you know, even in, in, in health tech um, or even just, even just basic services that you know, even in India for, that support hygiene or women's health and things like that that have just suffered. There's been some amazing technology startups there. We work in the, you know, the support female entrepreneurship a lot in Africa yeah. and other places, and we're seeing yeah. huge amounts of focus there. So yeah. It was a big question, um, but, but your answer is taking me to um, the next or a, another question, which is how are we going to respond to this um, total digitization of everything, end to end, supply chain from one end to the other, everything's going to be digital. And um, you, you raised your phone before and mentioned the SingPass, which is the Singapore government's um, uh, app enabling you to, um, you know, scan yourselves as you walk around. But um, I was listening to a Singapore lecture the other day and they were um, recommending that they use this pass for not just health purposes, but also to manage your finances, also for this other purpose and so forth. Um, and so I'm just wondering, what your, what your answer to that big question has led me to is how are we going to respond to this tracking of our every moment? Because um, it's not just tracking COVID. If these things like SingPass or any other digital platform that we are going to have to use um, as we completely digitize our entire world, that means our lives are going to be uh, exposed um, and it's going to raise even bigger cyber security questions. I'm just wondering... What, just, just let's just focus in on SingPass for a minute as an example of this this potential. Well, I mean, and all we think about that, yeah, and I think that this, what's really important is for one is I'd say that look, there's a very big commitment to ensuring that the you know, super high integrity behind this in 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 Singapore, and that you know that there have been a lot of statements that have been made about you know protecting the data that comes out of the Trace Together app in particular, right? So the Trace Together app is something that's that's separate, but they're not, you know, looking to consolidate that information, um, you know, in terms of, you know, anything beyond sort of making sure that we're keeping the, the, the I guess, the community safe. I think at the same time, you know, it, it, it brings about a, a very big point about just how do we ensure that, you know, people's information is protected. And I think that we talk about um, globally about data responsibility and, you know, consumers' rights to understand the data that's being held for them and whether they can edit or, or have it deleted if it's wrong at a corporate level, which I think is very, very important. Mm. I think what what's happened, and I think in, in, in Singapore in particular, we benefit from having you know, this digital infrastructure. And I think that what um, we're doing, what the, the country is really doing, I think, is being very focused on ensuring that in what you were referencing with SingPass was what is really an authentication capability, right? Because yeah. it's a small, it's essentially a digital identity that we have with, with SingPass. It's a, yeah. And because Singapore is small, they're able to do this. So I, I'm able to authenticate myself in the SingPass app. And so that can enable me to have a lot of services. So if I'm a, you know, if I'm a bank, I mean, instead of having, you know, I guess my own service or I can authenticate in SingPass if I wanted to, but you know, banks already have their authentication software, but in other areas, it, it's an important convenience. If I log into a government security or a government site that I want to, um, say for example, I'm going to go, hopefully go on a trip, I want to get my health certificate, right? I log in, it knows it's me, then I'm able to print it down as a secure channel. So I think that works. I do think, though, that, you know, there are some big issues about ensuring that um, there is responsible use and management of data. I think that's a very big issue. I think yeah. that many of us who have seen the social dilemma 
um, on Netflix didn't appreciate that, um, you know, how much disclosure there is about tracking of individuals and or behaviors and consent management. Yes. I think what's really important is putting the consumer or the individual in charge of that data and, and giving them visibility as to, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a where, really what, what are the, um, you know, the breadcrumbs that you might otherwise be leaving. And I think yeah. we've seen... Um, but you can say that, however, as you said before, Singaporeans um, have a high trust in their government um, and there's a high degree of, um, uh, what's the word, cooperation within the Singapore um, community. Um, just a couple of days ago, there was a threat by one of the leading um, wealthy industrialites, if you like, of Australia, threatening the Prime Minister of Australia that if he was going to um, suggest that they should have a central um, database for this, he was going to you know, drag him off to court and make sure it didn't happen because there yeah, was so concern I think there. This is a legitimate concern, and I think yeah. in a number of economies, because they're trying to, um, you know, there is an inherent you know, commitment to freedom and privacy and those types of things. And I think that you know, different economies and different societies are tolerant of different standards. And I think what's very, very important is that um, you know, everybody considers that. I think that you, know, you need to be able to have checks and balances in, in any system. I think that's important, but you know, naturally there are, you know, we don't have the same operating model in every country. And I think that what's critical to your point is trust. I think that to my mind is ultimately what's going on. And then I think that beyond that, there may be some philosophical issue about, yes. you know, access and, and, and freedom to be forgotten. Freedom, if you like. and, I think that, and, yeah. and, I, and I think that we, that is enshrined in a lot of um, the rights, of a lot of Western democracies for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that, you know, it's respected. I think people understand that, you know, that you want to be able to, to live your life. At the same time, I think that in many cases, it's about if you're going to be sharing information, yeah. that it's sort of on a consent basis. You understand what's being shared and for what, and there's a benefit to you from doing that. I think in the past, um, one, people haven't understood what information about them has been collected and how it's being used. Yeah. And, you know, and that's been a challenge for a number of people in the technology space, right? So I think that moving, um, and you can see this by the removal of cookies and these sorts of things, right? That they're, they're the changing environment. But any company, I think, um, and look, I think it's inappropriate to sort of make a judgment, I think, on political or country-based scenarios. I think that, you know, at the end of the day, it's about that environment and, and you have to operate within it. But as a company, what's very important to us is saying, look, we have to be able to maintain that trust. Yes. We need to be able to say that, look, if we're going to be um, in a situation where we may have identi you know, personally identifiable information, we should be able to show you what we have yeah. You as a consumer should be able to view that. Mm. You should be able to say, well, actually, that's not right. I want to request you to delete it. Or you should have a right to be forgotten. And, we, and, and certainly this ethical component of this is very, very important. Because think, as we move yeah. to what you talked about before, this entirely digital environment, yeah. you know, the brands that are trustworthy, that stand behind customers and act to protect the interests of those customers and consumers are going to be the ones that people gravitate towards. And I think that that's a very large responsibility, but I think that you, know, you need to take that very seriously. It's just like ethical AI, right? Yes. How do you make sure that your AI models don't discriminate? It's a machine, so <laughs> theoretically um, it shouldn't discriminate, but if the code person who wrote the code doesn't have the right mindset if we're yes. um we always need to figure out you know how do you how does the a decision get made and how do we able to explain why somebody got an offer like this or somebody got something different i think it's that transparency i, I think, think that's um, going to be important yeah, I think uh, we've got, an, we're going to have an awful lot of contestability because of, you know, just in the recent weeks or months, we've had um, stories of hacking of major governments and, and countries, you know, so if those things can happen, then we're going to well, see... Well, nation state terrorism is a very significant concern, right? And I think that naturally, I think that people are trying to ensure that they try to get on top of this. But I, but I do think that, 
you know, it's something that, you know, we have to be very aware of. And obviously, we all have to try to take, you know, mm. responsibility in terms of how, you know, the type of passwords we use, how we get, you know, familiar with those environments. And also, um, you know, make sure that, you know, we're, we're asking, you know, ourselves the right questions and demanding the mm. right kind of service from the, the companies with, which we, mm. with whom we do business. And I think mm. that's something that's critically important. And also, you know, Consumers today want to be working with with you know, um, companies that not only in the digital space obviously you know, mm. want to develop this and cultivate this trust, but more broadly, what are they doing in society and how are we contributing yes. to the communities in which we're operating? And I think that's a and the question is really about the sincerity yeah. that's behind that, right? I think that. A long time ago, people would have just gone, oh, I can do this sort of initiative and just be over there and then, you know, I'll just publish it and report it and great. Yes. Right? But I think people see through that. And I think that yeah. it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's got to be something that's part of what you do. And I think that why one of the reasons I, you know, I still work at Masco is that, you know, we are sincerely gone behind that and we have said, look, we want to include you know, in total, you know, a billion new individuals into the financial system. We yeah. are talking about that are having a legitimate digital financial identity um, mm -hmm. that enables you to participate mm -hmm. in, in the economy. Is yeah. a, it should be a, a fundamental human right. You've got to be able to do that in the right kind of way, yes. right? Yes. Commit to sustainability, commit to ensuring that there's equity across the board. Yes. Um, all those things, you know, we have, <laughs> and, and you know, support you know, small business, female entrepreneurship, it's all these things. I think we're really doing this not, you know, at, at a platitude level, we're committing to programs, we're investing significantly yeah. in these programs because it's important. Uh, these are raising some really big issues. We could go on and on and on, couldn't we? I mean, there's so yeah. many, there's so many, um, what do you call it, sort of red flags that are coming up out of this conversation. We need to make the journey. That's right. It's a more, it's a complex environment. And I think that, is, yeah. you know, you really have to be thinking about um, that trust equation. It's a and trust And that you're, yeah. you know, you're yeah. sincerely yeah. engaging with yeah. your community, sincerely yeah. engaging with your employees, sincerely engaging with your stakeholders. Hmm. Um, to, I just can't you know, see whole nations doing it. Um, customer groups can do it for brands um, because the brands have over time built up, you know, that... Um, uh, the, the the right for you know to be able to demonstrate over decades that they've been able to deliver. Um, nations, of course, have you know every three years they've got an election, <laughs> and you know one party or the others um, trying to pull the other one's you know philosophies and programs and strategy. Uh, yeah. It's a much harder true. equation. Oh, yeah. um, and your point, which is, I'm sorry, I've got to have to wrap up in a minute. Your point, right. which was, um, you know, the Western democracy versus the Eastern environment, which you live in, are very, very different. And a lot of what you're describing, um, when I think about the conversations, you know, that I read about last week with, you know, this threat to, you know, Morrison to take Morrison to court if he was to go down that route. Um, I just think we're going to have massive challenges over the next couple of years as we try and you know, complete the digitization that we have to have to live in a pandemic world. And um, the, the, the changes that took place in five months that would normally take five years, I think that's going to occur again and again and again. So um, we, we're going to have to get better at um, managing this as we go through organizations. So much more to talk about, um, Matthew. It's been really wonderful having your insights into the region um, and also hearing about what you're doing at MasterCard. So um, now there's that last tricky question which is um if you were the chief executive of the world uh yeah. what would be on your bucket list what would be top priority for you to address well you know i think that's a really good point but the kind of working off what we talked about earlier i'd say one is sort of economic inclusion and identity i think that you, know, yeah. you need to be able to ensure that you know we have participation and in, in that we're getting out to, yeah. to everybody i think that's one yeah. thing um secondly i think it's sort of you know, I originally thought about so equal pay for equal work, but what I think what's more important is addressing income inequality, because mm -hmm. I think that in some way there has to be the ability to distribute um, the benefits of all these things that we're talking about more equally across yeah. communities, yeah. because I think that we're seeing a much 
you know, greater disparity between the haves and the have-nots, right? And I think that if you're going to ensure that you want to have, a, you know, a positive environment um, in the world, I think we're going to have to think about how we address that. I think climate change and sustainability, you've got to sort of think through that, whether you believe it or not. Um, I think that, you know, sustainability is going to be important. Our population is growing, you know, food supply, security. How do we make sure that we just look after what we've been given, um, the, the planet, but also ensure that, you know, we're doing that in a sustainable way. And then lastly, I think, again, it's sort of this community engagement. I think that, again, it's about supporting, you know, the vulnerable, if you like, yeah. um, working with small business, you know, being, you know, again, it comes back to this, a much broader inclusion message, right? Because I think that if everybody has the ability to participate in whatever digital transformation, you know, or otherwise may come um, going ahead, I think we're yeah. going to ensure that, you know, it's a more positive place for everybody. So that would be, that probably be one of the four points that I would give. Well, you're going to be busy. Those are three big items. <laughs> Well, all, you've got to be ambitious, very, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But all very relevant and, um, you know, highly necessary. So thanks for that suggestion. And um, thanks for giving us your time today. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, so hopefully we'll talk to you again soon and uh, get an update from you at another time. You're welcome. So that's Matthew Driver from uh, MasterCard Asia Pacific. Thanks so much for your time today.